Okay, guys. Well, welcome to our webinar. For those of you guys who don't know me, my name is George Bogatuck. Uh, my primary function is a product specialist. I deal with the sales department, help out and support. So today we're going to talk about consisting and running multiple locomotives together. What we're going to do, a lot of what we're going to be talking about here is going to apply to Soundtrack Tsunami 2 products. But in all honesty, a lot of this will, con will follow original Tsunami or any other uh, NMRA DCC decoder that supports advanced consisting. These principles are not unique to Soundtracks. There are a couple of CVs, and we'll talk about those throughout the course of the presentation um, on how they're going to be applied. But ultimately, you know, we want to show you how you can get the most out of your Tsunami 2 decoders by using the proper type of advanced consisting and how the limitations of some of these other uh, methods do limit your availability and f of the features. So first off, what we're, here's a quick synopsis of what we're going to talk about. We are going to talk about DCC operation for a few minutes. I do believe this is important and integral to what we're going to be talking about today. So we are going to review this and kind of talk about the nuts and bolts behind the scenes of how the DCC signals are sent. We're going to talk a little bit about the purpose of consisting, the different types of consisting, how the DCC system handles the different types. And for those of you guys who are advocates of the NCE style, we will have a separate section on that and how it does perform during the, uh, during the webinar here. Uh, we'll do some conclusion, at, wrap up everything into a nice little bow. Um, so first off, let's talk about just DCC operation in general. So first off, what we have is the uh, cab, which is known as our throttle, and this is used to generate a command. And this is where we push the buttons, use the knobs or whatever, and that, those push buttons and so forth are sent of what we intend to the command station. The command station then interprets that and turns it into a DCC signal. The signal is then sent to the booster where it's amplified and sent out and broadcast onto the rails and then received by the decoder. Now, I know this is fairly rudimentary, but there's a couple of things I want to point out. Number one is this is a broadcast only transmission. So the DCC system has no idea, nor does it really care if the decoder has ever responded to the decoder command. If I take a locomotive off the track, for example, and I send that signal, the signal is still sent. The DCC system just, uh, there's no feedback to tell the system whether it ever got it or not. And so that's important because these commands are going to be sent out, broadcast all the time. Now, when we look at the signal itself, there's an address that's being sent. And this command is prefaced with an address, and it's intended to send to a particular locomotive. If the DCC command is intended for that, i.e., the decoder address matches that of the command, then it performs the task. If the decoder address does not match the address of the command, it continues on doing whatever was it was doing, whether it's sitting still, moving, blowing the horn, or doing whatever else. It just continues doing what it's doing until it's told to do something different. Now, when we look at the DCC track signal, there's actually four parts to the signal. The first off is what's called the preamble. It basically tells the decoder, hey, everybody, listen up. A new DCC command is coming. And when the decoders get that, their ears perk up and they start listening. The second part is what's called the address byte. And this is basically where we determine who the command is intended for. This is where you can have address 5859, address 589, 2303, or whatever your decoder address that you're intending the command to go. At that point, if the decoder is set to the address that you are intending, it continues listening. If it is not set to the address that the command is being sent to, it then goes back to sleep or continues doing whatever it was doing. Now, the third part is what's called the instruction byte, and this is basically what tells the locomotive to do something. For a lot of our purposes today, we're going to use the command move forward, speed step 10, turn on F0, turn on F1, turn on F4. Now, if you listen to that, you're going to notice I did not say turn on your headlight, turn on your bell, turn on your dynamic brakes. The command is actually intended F0, F1, F4. Your setup of the decoder and of your locomotive is telling the decoder what to do when it gets that respective command. So when you get an F0 command to your locomotive, it looks in a function mapping and says, oh, I'm supposed to turn on the headlight, and then psh, the light comes on. 
The last part of this is the error detection byte. And this is the basically end of transmission. This tells the decoder, okay, I've sent the command. And once the decoder receives all four parts of it and does not have any errors or issues, it then performs what it's told to do. In this case, move forward, speed step 10, turn on the F0 headlight, turn on the F1 bell, turn on the F4 dynamic brake. And the decoder just simply behaves. Again, the DCC system does not have any idea, nor does it care if the decoder ever received the command or is even following it. Now, the other thing I want to point out is there's 200 data packets sent per second, and so there's a lot of times where you get instant response. But depending on how your system is built, um, I know especially in club environments, things can get bogged down where you may see it takes a couple of seconds for a horn to blow or a speed change to be made. And if you do the math by 200 packets per second and all this, and it takes a few seconds for your locomotive to respond, that means there's that much DCC traffic being sent through before the command station can get back to your command. And so this is where you have to go in and start purging addresses, cleaning up, and a lot of this you're going to find will be uh, either left throttles that are st stuck to a different address, improperly cleared uh, throttles, and a lot of those type of things can lead to different DCC issues, such as two commands being sent to the same address, one on your active throttle, the other either another throttle stuck on the, the layout somewhere that you don't know about, or if it's improperly cleared or if the command station thinks it's part of a consist, then it could be blocking some of those commands. And we're going to talk about uh, consisting here today, which is the point of the topic. But understanding the DCC signal is what is important. Now, when we look at the DCC signal, this is a big thing because we can't see it. Uh, you have to have special tools to be able to look at it, read it, and even then you don't necessarily know what you're looking at. If you take a typical multimeter and just attach it to the track and look at it in AC volts, you might get it close, but it's not going to be an accurate representation of what the actual DCC track voltage is. Uh, to do that, you need an RMS voltmeter, which is a root mean squared. Um, you can also use an oscilloscope, which most people don't have in their uh, hobby room. Um, but our friends at Tony's Train Exchange do make a product called Railroad Amp Meter. Uh, you can use that to actually measure properly the DCC uh, voltage and also measure current draw and stuff like that. So those are good tools to have. It's up to you. It's not a mandatory thing. But, you know, this is kind of why I bring this up is because since we can't see the DCC signal, we kind of have to learn how that's being sent behind the scenes so that we can have mastery of our decoders. So we're going to move on to, you know, what is consisting. And, and when we talk about this, we're running multiple units together. This can be mostly done with diesels, uh, but you can do steam, uh, multiple steam locomotives, multiple diesel locomotives, or combination thereof. For our presentation today, we're going to use our diesel locomotives here because uh, it is more common to run multiple locomotives. I know myself, like many of you, have too many locomotives, and so it's more fun to run three or four or five together than it is to run them by themselves, but this will give you an uh, overview of how to do this. We're going to talk about a little of this. Consistent standard function mapping makes consisting easy, and once we get into the nuts and bolts, you'll understand why. Um, realistic operation, you don't change the locomotive parameters. In this particular scenario, to have the horn and bell on these guys off, we have to go in and change the locomotive parameters, i.e. value uh, for volume levels, uh, or in even the case of the rear locomotive here facing backwards, uh, we have to change the normal direction of travel. And by changing all these parameters, we get into a whole lot of now they're stuck together and you can't break them up or change them around. And we'll talk about the details of all of this. But when the real railroads consist locomotives, all of them behave as if they were single units. So you typically have a crew in the lead unit and then they control all of the locomotives in your train, whether it be two in the front and one way in the back as distributed power or whatever the case may be. And so what we're trying to do is to recreate that as well so all of our locomotives in our consist do behave as if they're a single unit. Now, using uh, advanced consisting, you can build it and broken up on the fly, and we'll talk about how to do that and it adds the ability for easy use of helpers, DPUs, and things like that. So these are some of the glints as to why we want to consist. So next up, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about setting up our decoder. 
Now we've done a lot of webinars and a lot of videos on our YouTube channel on how to set up your locomotives, different features, how they work, things like that. So once you go through and set up the motors to operate the way you want them to, there's a few things I want to point off here. Consistency is going to pay off. And some of the things I want to mention is, uh, for example, you want to use the same momentum speed ratings, same brake rates, things like that. So that way, not only do you have a more predictable response consistently when you're running your trains, but also you can take any locomotive and consist it with any other locomotive. I mean, I've got four locomotives here, and I can take any four of these and run them together. I can make any one the lead unit, any one the middle, and any one the trailing unit just as I see fit. So when you're setting up your locomotives, you know, kind of determine a preset, uh, whether it be function mapping, sound selections, uh, dynamic exhaust, volume levels, things like that. Get all of that ready to go the way you want to, and then build your consist. Now, key point here at the bottom here is uh, Soundtrack Tsunami 2 are featured what's called dynamic digital exhaust. And we're normally going to set this to a low sensitivity. And the reason for this is that if you have a high sensitivity, as your trains are running, you could get a little bit of a coupler bump or something like that that can potentially cause the notching to get out of sync. So when you have a low sensitivity, you still get that effect, but it's not going to respond instantly if you get a slight coupler bump. Also, I know a lot of people are infatuated with speed matching, and this is where you want to do that beforehand. And typically with that, I always recommend pick a locomotive that runs the way you want out of the package with no changes and match everything to that. And the reason for that is if I match this locomotive to this guy and then I match this locomotive to this guy, these two won't be able to run together very well. So when you get in there and, and do that, pick one and match everything to it. Um, time consuming is a long and can be tedious process. It's not difficult, it's just time consuming because you have to do a lot of, of trial and error, you know, step this and then adjust the CV till it matches, go to the next speed step, adjust it till it matches. There are shortcut ways. Be sure to check out the user's guide, but this is one thing you'll want to do before you get into the consisting setup. So once you have everything set up and ready and running the way you want, now we're going to build our consist. So let's take a look at the five different types of consist that do exist in model railroading. First of all is a simple consist. Then we have a basic, advanced consist, which is what we're going to recommend, extremely high. We'll talk about that as we go. NCE style, which is a little bit of a hybrid style, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. And then Soundtracks Intelligent Consisting, we're going to touch briefly on with our sound car decoder and why it matters and what, what you can do with it. So first off, we're going to have some diagrams here, and we're going to kind of illustrate physically what's going on behind the scenes when you build the different types of consists. So first off here, we're going to talk about a simple. And this is a consist where you basically set all of your locomotives to the same address. In our example here, we're going to do address three. Locomotives run elephant style, nose to tail. When you send a DCC command, remember, it's in this particular case, we're going to send our command, locomotive three, move forward, speed step 10, turn on F0, turn on F1, turn on F4. Well, what happens is, is that when you turn that on, F0, all of these locomotives are going to turn on their headlight. When you blow the horn, the F2, all of them are going to blow the horn. The DCC system sends out one command to your train, which is great, but all of these other sounds are going to come on. So how do we do that? We go in and we set the volumes of horn and bell on these trailing guys to a value of zero so that it's still technically playing the horn sound, but at no volume. So if I want to take this guy and run it independently, now I have to go back and reset my volume levels and reset all of that so that that way I can run this one by itself. Now, as I mentioned, the DCC system sends out one command, so you're not really tying up a whole lot of traffic on the DCC signal, and it is transferable. So if I decide to come to any of your layouts and run my train, it's going to operate exactly the same way. I select, in this case, Loco 3, run it on there, and it's going to run the same way it did when it was at home. Now, the key here, as I mentioned, it does require CV manipulation. If I want to have this last guy facing rearward, well, when a forward command comes, these two guys are going to move forward. This guy's going to do that unless I go in and change the normal direction of travel in CV29. So now I'm going in and really changing a lot of the parameters that I have to, to get all these guys to run the way I want to. And we're going to show you how advanced consisting, you're, you are programming some CVs, but you're doing it in a different way, and it's going to give you the ability to not have to change the locomotive parameters every time you want to run multiple locomotives together. So next up, we're going to talk about a basic. And a basic style uses the memory in one of these things, 
or in one of these things to build your consist. The DCC system remembers what locomotives are in the consist and which direction they're facing and sends the commands out accordingly. So if we look at our DCC signal, hey, everybody listen up, locomotive 1000, move forward, speed step 10, turn on F0, turn on F1, turn on F2, locomotive 1001, move forward, speed step 10, locomotive 1002, move reverse, speed step 10. Well, if you'll notice, there were none of the functions built up to send to those trailing units. And so what happens is, as we go through and we've got all these features built into the Tsunami 2, such as braking, dynamic braking, and a lot of those type of sound effects that you want to take advantage of, now you lose on all of your trailing units, no matter how many you have or you're limited by your command station, because what happens is, is that this was developed when there was nothing but motor decoders, so we didn't have sound. And so what happens is the only thing that was important was lights. So in that case, the motor decoder moves forward, turns on its headlight, turns on its ditch lights, or whatever the case was. Great. The trailing unit, since there's no sound anyway, we don't need to turn on the lights. Same thing with the last unit. And so this is where this is developed. Now the problem is, is it wastes memory slots, because now if you see for my train there, it's going to send out three commands to my train to run the locomotives together. The other side of this is that if we go into a club environment and you have a big club where say there's you know 10 trains running on the track at the same time, that's now at least 30 commands that are running through that DCC system before the system gets back to your command. And if you get into the uh, commands that are stuck on a throttle or not being operated or, or whatever, this is where you start getting these delays. The other side of this is let's say I bring my trains, I run this train, and then I go home, and I didn't clear it out of the memory. Well, let's say uh, one of my other fellow members comes in and decides to bring his Amtrak 589. He puts it on the track, tries to run it. Well, the system thinks it's part of a consist because I didn't clear my consist when I left. And so therefore, his locomotive will not run. He can blow the horn maybe, but he cannot run the locomotive because the command station is blocking all of those commands because it thinks it's part of a consist, and so it doesn't want this locomotive trying to drag the other two down the track. Now, like I said, none of the functions are going to be sent to the trailing units. And so to do this, I'm going to illustrate this right here for you to kind of show you what we're going to do. So I'm going to turn on, I'm going to use a Digitrack system and I'm going to power up the track. Now I've got 5856 here on the front and I'm gonna blow the horn. Now I've got locomotive 589 right behind it and I can blow the horn. Now I'm gonna add these to the consist. Now I have to make sure on my throttle that the forward command is sent so that this locomotive is facing forward. I hit the MU button and the plus and now that adds this locomotive to this consist. Now I have to do the same thing for my trailing unit here. So I'm going to select loco 2303. Now I have to make sure that my button is facing in the reverse direction. Oops, wrong one. I have to make sure that this is facing in the reverse because this locomotive is facing rearward. Now I hit my MU and my plus, and now the locomotive is joined into my consist. So now when I start to run the locomotives, I gotta get them started up first, so bear with me a second while they all start. Now once we get everybody going, we're going to make sure we're in the forward direction. I'm going to start moving my train. And you're going to see all three locomotives run. I come to a stop. They come to a stop. I blow the horn. You're only hearing the horn out of that lead unit. Same thing. I change direction. Let's get going. But now what happens if I want to send the F11 brake sound? And I want to stop my train. I've used the F11 brake to stop my train. When I hit F11, you hear the brake squeal on this guy, but these guys keep running down the track. Well, if you do the same thing, if we change directions here, my brakes are still set on this locomotive. These guys are going to continue running because my DCC command is still telling me to run at speed step 10. So these guys are going to come running up and push, start pushing the locomotive down the track. 
So therefore, you're not getting any of these function commands on any of these trailing locomotives. And so when I want to use things like the dynamic brake, I'm only getting it on my lead locomotive. So I'm going to go ahead and power the track off. We'll go ahead and shut the track power down. Now to take these out of a consist, we do have to go in and select the locomotive and then hit MU minus and take it out. And again, if we don't remember which locomotives are in the consist, we're not getting the functions or we're not able to do it. And to clear it, you have to hopefully remember which unit is the lead unit. So there's a lot of things here that you're not going to get using a, sta a basic consist with your command station. Now the next step is what's called an advanced consist, and this is what we highly, highly recommend. Because what this does is the DCC system sends out one command to an alias, and that alias is a number between 1 and 127, and that is the address of your consist. Then you use the decoder's memory to tell the decoder which functions to respond to when it's in a consist. So if we look at our command here, locomotive uh, 20, move forward, speed step 10, turn on F0, turn on F1, turn on F4, what we're going to do is we're going to determine which ones of those functions the locomotives respond to. So in this case, locomotive 1000, which is my lead unit, you see a brief list there of all the functions we've told it to respond to. The headlight, the bell, the horn, the short horn, F4 is our dynamic brakes, F5 and 6 are RPM plus and minus, F7 dims the headlight, F8 is mute, F9 is our grade crossing, F11 is our brakes, and F12 is our brake select. Now, when we go to the second unit, hey, everybody, listen up, Loco 20, move forward, speed step 10, Locomotive 1000 says, hey, I'm part of Consist 20. Then it goes into its memory and says, I'm only supposed to respond to F4, F5, F6, F8, 11, and 12. And the same thing with the trailing unit, except now we've added the reverse light. And so this is where the decoders can really shine because the advanced Consist that's used in the decoder memory. So here's the best advantage, is that if I do go to, say, any one of your uh, layouts, I can pick this up, put it on the layout, exactly the same form it was, select the address 20, and it's going to run just like any other locomotive that's out there. The command station is no smarter. It thinks it's talking to one locomotive, address 20. The one thing I did fail to mention is on the basic consist is that it's non-transferable. So if I pick these locomotives up and take them to your club layout or anywhere else, I have to rebuild that consist in your club layout. And then you run into, again, possibilities of people having multiple locomotives that are the same. And so we have a lot of, of duplication, especially nowadays with a lot of ready-to-roll models having you know, extreme detail. We're not having to do the painting and, de and weathering and so forth as much as we used to because these models come out looking perfect out of the factory. And so we find a lot of people have the same numbers, whether it's 58, 56, or 589. And so what this does, is this then tells the system that I'm only talking to address 20. So you can have six 58, 56 locomotives on your layout, but if they're all in their own consist, then you're not going to get any conflicting commands. Again, this is the best way to do this. And so how, to do, how we do this is an advanced consist. These are some standard recommended practice uh, CV, CV19, 21, and 22. And then with Tsunami 2, we're using CVs 245 and 246 to add in the higher functions. CV19 is the consist address. It sets a value of 1 through 127, and that's going to be your train address. You can use either the first two numbers of the lead unit, the second two numbers of the lead unit. Uh, it can be a train number ID. It can be a club member ID number. Or in some cases, as I use address 20 most of the time when I visit, uh, it can be for a favorite sports hero, uh, jersey, some number, stuff like that. So when we build this, the, the consists are going to be selected in CV19. Now to tell the locomotive it's facing backwards or facing in the reverse direction, we're going to add 128 to that value. And don't worry, we're going to get to an example here in just a second. Now CVs 21, 22, 245, and 246 are what activate the functions. And this is where we tell the decoder which functions you're going to respond to to that consist address. So when we get that address 20, move forward, speed step 10, turn on F0, turn on F1, turn on F4, this is where we tell the decoder to decide which ones to respond to. So when we look at our locomotives, 
with aftermarket factory tsunami function mapping, we're going to look at a lead locomotive turns on a headlight, ditch lights, horn, bell, and also can F7 dim the headlights. But all locomotives in our consist are going to use the brakes, the dynamic brakes, the F8 mute, and you can go through the list, some other ones as well, like F14 switching mode. This is where consistent function mapping pays off, because if you go through and every one of your locomotives is function mapped the same way, uh, every locomotive uses the same button to control that effect, then once you calculate these values for these CVs, it doesn't change. This is where Tsunami 2 really shines because you can take any function and assign it to any button. So you can pick what your personal tastes are. So when we go to the next page here, we look at the standard function mapping. This is what the Tsunami 2 looks like when you put, take it out of the package and install it in your decoder. When the decoder receives an F0 command, it typically turns on the headlight and backup light depending on direction. F1 is the bell, horn, short horn. And you can make this list up for yourself, or you can follow the standard aftermarket list, whichever works best for you. Some of the ones we're going to be talking about explicitly in this case, horn, bell, headlights, uh, short horn, dynamic brakes, and the mute. And we're going to set this consist up here using the example here uh, with advanced consist. But if you go through the list there, you can see how some of them can be uh, used for all of the locomotives. For example, like I mentioned, F14 switching mode, you may want to turn the sander valve or the cab chatter and all of them. It's, it's entirely up to you how you want to set it up, but this is how you're going to do it. So first off, we look at CV19. And as I mentioned, CV19 is our consist address. So our lead locomotive facing in the forward direction, CV19 is going to be set to a value of 20. Now CV21, 22, 245, and 246 tell the decoder which functions to respond to. So those charts over there on the side are going to be the respective CVs and their structure. And if you notice, each function uh, F0 through F28 are assigned a CV and a bit. If you want the decoder to respond to that, you're going to add that bit value into the total. If you do not want it to respond, you add zero and move on. So let's look at our lead locomotive. In CV21, we're going to turn on functions 1 through 8, all of them. So F1 is the bell, F2 is the horn, F3 is the short horn, F4 is dynamic brakes, F5 and 6 are my RPM plus and minus, F7 dims my headlight, and F8 is mute. So I want all of those on on my lead unit. But if you look down there to the middle unit, EV21 value there is set to 184 because we're going to turn on only F4 for our dynamic brakes, F5 and 6 for RPM plus and minus, and then F8 to mute and that's where we come up with the value of 184. Now, you look at the, the last locomotive or our trailing locomotive, CV21, it's set to 184 as well. And this is where consistent function mapping pays off because you can decide which buttons respond to which. Now, if we go back up to our lead locomotive here and we sit, look at CV22, and this is where we turn on our headlight, which is function zero in the forward direction, F9, which is our grade crossing sequence, F11 and 12. We don't need to turn on F10 straight to 8. In this instance, we're not. When we add up these values, which is 1 plus 4 plus 16 plus 32, that's where we get the value of 53. That's kind of how it works. Now, in CV245 and 246, you see these are the higher functions. Most of the time on my consists, I don't enable a lot of these things like servicing or, or those type of sounds because typically that's going to be done on an individual basis. And so mo the, the only common ones I found were F14, which is switching mode, and F20, which is the uh, sanding valve. Um, and on the trailing unit there, you'll notice that the back uh, on the CV22, you actually have a different value because we're adding in the reverse light. And this is where... This is how you set this up. Now, the other thing is CV19, when it comes to our consist address, the value of 20 is for all locomotives facing forward. But if I have my locomotive facing rearward, I'm going to add 128 to that value. So in this case, 20 plus 128 equals 148. So if any of my middle locomotives are facing in the reverse direction, now I can just simply add that value. So basically, when the, com the coder gets that command, hey, I'm part of CONSIS 20, oh wait, but I'm facing in the reverse direction. And that's how it determines based on how you set these CVs. Let's do this really quickly here. So I'm going to turn on my track power again. And I'm going to kill my CONSIS here really quickly. 
And while I'm doing that, I'm going to add these locomotives into an advanced consist. So I'm going to take CV, uh, right now I'm talking to 2303. I've just taken it out of the consist. So using mainline ops mode programming, I'm going to program CV19 to a value, in this case, of 148. Now, the one thing I do want to point out is that when you program on the main line, this is no different than a function command. In other words, when I send a function command to my locomotive, locomotive 2303, blow your horn, only that decoder is responding to the command because the address 2303 says these guys ignore the command. Same thing with programming on the main line. So if I say locomotive 2303, change CV19 to 148, only this decoder responds. Now in the essence of time, I have already set up CVs 21, 22, 245, and 246. So I'm gonna move over to the next locomotive here and I'm gonna grab 589 and I'm gonna take it out of my consist again. And now I'm gonna program again on the main line. I'm gonna program CV19 now to a value of 20 so that it's facing forward. And again, I can talk to just that one locomotive. Now the last one I need to do is I need to talk to 5856 here and I need to program its CV19 to a value of 20 as well. So now I've got my locomotives now I'm going to select local 20 on my throttle. Now this is interesting guys, I'm going to tell you what's going on right there. Because I did not clear local 5856 off my throttle. One throttle was telling it to turn on F3, the other was telling it to turn off F3. So what I need to do, local 5856, I need to clear some of these commands here really quickly. All right, now I'm gonna select a log, and I'm gonna explain what's going on here in just a second here. I'm gonna change this now to a different address. Okay, so now when I'm talking to address 20, which on my throttle here, I have address 20, and I have address 100 on the other throttle, and this is what was throwing me off, because this one was telling F3 to turn on, this one was telling Consist 20 to turn F3 off, and so that's why you were getting that horn command. And the problem was I didn't catch it before I was pushing buttons. So now when I run my Consist, I start to move my locomotive in the... We're going to go forward. We're going to start moving. You see all my locomotives respond. They're all running together. I blow my horn. Only my lead unit is blowing the horn, ringing the bell, and when I hit the brakes, which is F11, they all respond. Every one of them sets the brakes, change directions, release the brakes, and they're all running together. Now these trailing units are getting the function commands because they're being sent to the consist address and the decoder is deciding how to respond to that command. Same thing when I type in dynamic brakes, which is F4. Now you hear all these locomotives turning on their dynamic brake sounds. And I turn off the F4. And you hear them all come together. We use our brakes to come to a stop. We reduce our throttle. And then just so you guys can hear better, I'm going to hit the F8, which is going to be mute. And they all go quiet. So that's kind of how an advanced consist works. And so by using these five, five CVs, once you figure your function mapping out and how it works, you go through and build the structure for these CVs to follow these charts. What's my lead locomotive do on every locomotive I've ever chose? What's my middle locomotive do? And what's my trailing locomotive do? Now, a couple of things to note when it comes to an advanced consist. And this is what was happening here and just when this one blowing its horn constantly. The loco will still respond to function commands sent to its address. So if I send commands to 5856, the decoder itself knows it's part of a consist address 20, so it's ignoring all the motor commands, but it will still respond to function commands. 
And part of that reason, this is going to come into play really heavily when we talk about NCE style consisting here in the next segment. But part of the reason you can do this is that typically, let's say for example, if this was our first setup of the day, these locomotives are in the off condition, I can go in and manually start up each one of them more like a real engineer would do and then grab my consist and then run the train back and forth. So that's where the individual startup's possible. This is also a case where you can go into, say, a fueling rack and individually fuel each locomotive on that fueling rack. So you're actually doing something instead of just sitting there uh, wasting you know, time or go get a beverage, whatever the case is. Now the other thing here is this is great for distributed power light setup. So if I've got these two units on the front and this guy's at the tr end of my train, I can turn on my light and because it's ignoring the motor command sent to the decoder address, I can turn on that rear light and dim it, and then all of those commands to the F0 and the F7 for my consist are being ignored by this guy. And the last thing I want to point out is to take a locomotive out of a consist, all you have to do is set CV19 to a value of zero. Because once CV19 is set to zero, the decoder no longer is even referencing or looking at or cares what the values of CV21, 22, 245, and 246 are even set to because they're not referenced. So this way when you build the consist, you have that chart next to you. You can say, okay, this is the values I set the decoder to when I set up. So it overwrites what was there. If it was a middle unit before, it can become a lead unit later on. While I go to the next card here, I'm going to talk about this. I'm actually going to change over to the NCE style or the NCE system here in front of us. But this is a list here that I have. This is a screenshot of what I take on my phone when I travel because when I bring locomotives with me to different layouts and things like that, I get to run trains sometimes and I'm very thankful that I get the opportunity to do that. But I don't remember even what all 28 functions are all the time because I have Mopac stuff. I typically model 1978 Missouri Pacific. And then some of you guys know that I've kind of become a little bit more of a modern nut partially due to lighting. And so I have some DNSF stuff. And so the lighting assignments and some of the function assignments may vary between the two eras that I've chosen. And so these are screenshots of what I carry around on my phone so that when I'm running, I can look, quickly look and see. Now what's not shown in there is below that is my consist values. I can go through and quickly set up. And so if I take any locomotives, put them on the track, I can simply build a consist really quickly. So to kind of show you the transferability of this, I'm gonna grab my NCE system here. I'm gonna select Loco 20 and I'm gonna go ahead and send a uh, non-zero motor command to get these guys started up. And you're going to hear these locomotives fire up. Now again, loco consist 20 right here on the screen. Blow the horn. Now that they're all started up, let's release the brakes. This lead unit has a current keeper, so it remembered that the F11 brake was on when I switched systems. So now the locomotives are running. Now when I take my F11 brake and I hit my F11, you see the train stop. My throttle is still saying to move at speed step two. I can change direction, release my brakes, and the locomotives all work together in concert, just as if they were a single unit. So it doesn't matter how many you have on there, the only limitation is how much your booster can handle as far as track power. So we'll bring this to a stop. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to kill my consist. So I'm going to take CB19 on all three of these locomotives and I'm going to set them to zero. So while I'm doing that, I'm going to talk about the NCE style consist and we're going to build that and show you the difference. So I'm going to mute these guys. And we're going to take CV19 and set it to zero. So now, when it comes to NCE style consisting, this is actually a little bit of a hybrid system between a basic consist and an advanced consist. The DCC system typically on an advanced consist would send one command to my train. But NCE style uses two commands. One to my advanced consist address, which it does set in CV19. The second command is sent to address 5856 to send the function commands. Again, a lot of this was developed when there was nothing but motor decoders, and so it didn't matter if any functions were on the trailing units. Only the lead unit had the lights. And so this is 
what this is how an NCE style works and we'll get to the illustration here in just a second but it does set CV19 it does use the command station memory to build your consist because if I take this NCE style consist and I build it and I try to run a 589 by itself it's going to say this is part of a consist you can't run it and so it's going to block your commands because it thinks it's part of a group now again your function commands must still be set individually now there is a setting in your NCE style send functions to consist and that is an option that you can do but again the NCE system does not set CVs 21, 22, 245 and 246 for you you still have to go back and do that yourself if you want that to be enabled so there is a way to do that but it does involve extra steps and at that point now you're doing more work than what a typical advanced consist would be and the other thing here is this doesn't work to any DCC layout so during the NCE setup process and I'll show you the screenshots here in just a second this will automatically calibrate which your CV19 value is going to be and so what's happened is that if you don't pay attention to what that number is and you pick this lo locomotive consist up and you go to another layout well, CV19 is set. Remember, it's ignoring motor commands sent to 5856 or 589 or whatever. And so you can run into issues if you try to move this to a different system. Same thing. So let's go to the next screen here. We'll look at the illustration and then we'll build this and show you the difference. So your DCC command station sends out two commands. First one is to loco 127. And when you're building your advanced cut, your NCE style, it starts at address 127 and works its way down to the next open slot because, again, it's using the DCC system memory to do that. And so 127, move forward, speed step 10. That's it. Second command is loco 1000, turn on F0, turn on F1, turn on F4, or whatever the case is. And that's what's sent to the lead unit. So, again, your trailing units never get any of the F11 braking commands or anything like that unless you go through and set it up and do all the CVs so it's a little bit more time consuming to go through and do the NCE style and I'm not saying that any of them are wrong I'm just saying I want you to understand how they work so that you can decide what's best for you so now we're going to go ahead and build our consist and this says enter equals advanced so consist address here it says consist address is 127 so unless we want to change that where we can we just hit enter lead locomotive 58 56 and we're going to press enter direction of this locomotive is forward enter that just sets cv 19 to a value of 127 now now the rear locomotive which is 2303 enter this locomotive is facing reverse, so I have to hit the reverse button. Enter. Now I'm going to add a loco, and this is 589. Enter, and this locomotive is facing forward. Yes. All right, so now I have in my screen con 5856. So when I send my command, you heard the motor command, which is what triggers these guys to start up. So we'll let them settle in. Now again, I blow my horn. It's only sent to the lead unit. My headlight's only sent to the lead unit. Train starts to run, but when I hit the F11, I must have that set up as send functions to consist. I was playing around with this, so bear with me a second. Let me disable that. Yeah, somebody set this. All right, so out of the package, an NCE system would run. We're going to run speed step three. When I set the F11, now once I've taken consist functions away, these guys never receive that command, and so they continue on. So this is why this is important, is because when you have things like that, you want to be able to make sure that you get the full advantage of all of your different locomotives in your consist. So you can see the limitations. There are settings you can do to make it work, but again, you're doing the same thing as what a standard advanced consist is doing anyway, and the advanced consist standard is transferable uh, a lot easier than using the NCE style because now it also will block commands 
sent to 589 because it thinks it's part of a consist. So I won't be able to run this locomotive independently until I take out of the NCE style consisting. So the last type of consisting we're gonna talk about is intelligent consisting. This is used for our sound car where we wave a magnet over the decoder. It triggers the decoder into search mode. I don't have to program CVs to add it into a train. I simply press a function button four times. The DCC system sends that command. The sound car decoder sees that command and joins now commands to that either locomotive or consist address, depends on how you set it up. There's no CV programming during the, the consisting process. You will want to go in and set CVs so that you can have things like the F11 break active during that consisting because CVs 21 and 20 do, are still enabled. You can do multiple cars at a time and so rather than having to simply program all these CVs to each individual, you can wave your magnet over each sound car, hit your F8 four times and they're joined, done. Um, so you can do one car, 10 cars, five cars, whatever the case is, you have a one minute window to hit that F8 command. Um, so we'll have a future webinar on sound car and all the ins and outs of all the details of all the things you can do with that. Uh, we also do have some short videos on our YouTube channel as well.